Hello everyone and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first front page of 2023. I hope your festive period was full of joy, happiness and good health. My New Year's resolution is to say at the top of each programme that if you're watching on YouTube, as indeed you almost certainly are, could you please like, comment, subscribe and share. We have three very uh, interesting subjects to talk about this week. We're looking at two trainers who win loads of races and punters who aren't allowed to bet on those trainers winning races. Uh, talking about the stories this week, my Racing Post colleague, senior reporter Chris Cook, specialist writer of the year, Jonathan Harding. Um, so my New Year's resolution, like, comment, subscribe, share, go to the gym a bit more. Chris? Um, I've, I haven't made one. No. Um, Bank more winners at bigger prices. That seems good. like a good one. Yeah, I, like that. I, I tell you, what, I was writing a sort of roundup of all the festive action yesterday. Yeah. Um, and there must have been about twenty-five races mentioned in there. I was thinking, oh, I didn't back that winner. Didn't back that winner. Didn't back that winner. It's just it's been an embarrassing week, frankly. So some work is required. Right. So we move from that positive uh, review <laughs> of the Christmas period to you, Jonathan. What, what, what are you? What are you? Uh, setting out your stall to achieve in 2023? I tend to throw a few darts at it knowing that some mm. of them will fail. Yeah. So I was doing Duolingo, trying to learn French on the train. Ah, bon. I've been to the gym twice and hated every second of that. Nice. Um, and grim, yeah, isn't it? try and eat a bit better, all sorts. I think try, try and have several and yeah. then when invariably 99% of them fail, you might be up on the year. I I'm signing up to a group personal training um, thing in, uh, uh, based on Tattenham Corner. Which is nice, isn't it? Group personal training, I think it's the future. Wait, are you running around Tatnam Corner? Or no, I, I, I have done that, <laughs> done that regularly. Not, 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 as, not as fast as a derby winner, but... Group personal group training. Personal tra anyway, you, you don't need to know about my group personal, tra personal training issues. You want to know about the key racing stories in this first edition. And one of them will link us back to that Christmas racing period. And a trainer, Jonathan, who just keeps winning races. Exactly right, yes. Mr. Willie Mullins had, a, even by his exceptionally high standards, had a fantastic Christmas. It was a double on the final day of the Christmas festival at Leopardstown, gave him his 31st top level victory of 2022, which accounts for roughly 40% of all the grade ones in Britain and Ireland, which I'll just let that sink in for a moment, yeah. is what we might say dominant. Um, obviously, he has the ammunition but he also places his horses fantastically well and had a very good spell over Christmas. I think this raises two key points of debate, um, which I'll open to the floor. One is Willie Mullins, indisputably the best trainer in Britain and Ireland. Paul Nichols and the like might have something to say about that, mm -hmm. but he's certainly in the conversation. And two, is this level of dominance good for the sport? Now, I'll caveat it with, we had a lot of different trainers winning the races at Kempton in Britain, so it's ne not necessarily a Britain and Irish problem, per se, it can be, it has been historically. But in Ireland, the idea that one trainer is winning this many top races in such a short window can't be good for sort of betting interests, and I would argue not good for the sport either. What we do about it is another question altogether. I would say the answer to the first of your questions is Willie Mullins indisputably the best trainer in Britain and Ireland, I would say, I don't think you can say indisputably. Definitely, you can't say I that, mean, no. You, you, he, has, he has raw material to die for going yeah. into his yard, but I think it's very hard to say that if Paul Nichols, Nicky Henderson, Gordon Elliott, Henry de Bromhead, Joe Tizard didn't get those horses coming into their yard, that they wouldn't be winning all these races too. And that's only mentioning the, the very top Absolutely. trainers. Absolutely. I mean, conceivably the best trainer in the country or in Britain and Ireland put together. It could be someone with five horses, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. Um, and, you know, no one will ever call that person the best there is because they just won't no. make that sort of level of impact. Um, yeah, we, we're not on a level playing field, are we? And, and the thing is, every year goes by, um, Willie gets better and better at identifying the best material. Um, and, and he does he, very good, he, he does great things with them. Absolutely. No I mean, one could deny no he's a brilliant trainer. He's a genius trainer um, yeah. and, and will be remembered, you know, with, with all the greats. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with, with every year that goes by, I think it gets harder and harder to measure how good he is just by looking at what his horses are achieving because, you know, the, the kind of material that he's getting should be achieving great things. Did you look at those those statistics that came up at the end of the year in terms of not just how really dominated Christmas, but how he dominated the the graded races in Britain and Ireland in 2022? And did you look at that and think, oh, or did you think, what an astonishing achievement? 
And I think I've, I've got more to the ugh end of the scale just now. Yeah. Because, you know, you see quite a few of these races and they're not as competitive as they should be. Um, I thought sort of Fast El Vega, um, his win at Leperstone over Christmas, mm -hmm. was a sort of case in point. You know, from an early stage, he was granted a sort of uncontested lead. And, you know, he, at some, he's obviously a brilliant racehorse, right? But uh, we don't know how good. Um, he hasn't really been tested yet. At some stage, it's going to be tougher tests for him. But like the next three in the betting in that race, we're all from the same stable. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, unsurprisingly, the race worked out really nicely for him. The New Year's Day race at Tremor, um, which this year was a proper contest. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, last year, I think, Willie had all four runners. Um, and you just, you know, for people who aren't deeply embedded in the sport, that must be a kind of strange thing to see. And as a punter, I don't think that makes for an inviting race at all. But we're getting more and more of that kind of race. Yeah. It's, it's clearly not ideal. I don't think anybody could say it's a tremendous thing that one trainer is so dominant numerically in these graded races. But can you also make a, an argument to say that um, he's now got so many of the best horses that he has to run those best horses against each other? So we do see... State man taking on Vauban, two incredibly talented young hurdlers in a Matheson hurdle that maybe we wouldn't do if one was trained by Willie Mullins and one was trained by somebody else. Or is that just is that just a perverse way of reading the situation? You prefer his competition to be provided by somebody else. Yeah. If they uh, haven't got the horses to take well, him on. This is it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of. I think that's probably the the almost compliment because it is a meritocracy. I mean, he's got there because of his ability to spot horses and everything else and because yep. of the material he attracts and because of his track record and it's we're operating in a system where he's risen to the top let's not forget that but at the same time the, the kind of best thing you can say about him is he's he's reached such a point level of dominance that he's providing his own competition I mean mm -hmm. that's extraordinary isn't it yeah although it, it, it also becomes helpful to him because yes. you know when someone some other trainer looks at the Five day decks for that race and goes, oh, there's a Willie Mullins grade one horse and another great Willie Mullins grade one horse. It puts you off having a go at it. You know, you so in a way you're almost scaring away the opposition even before you get to the day of the race. And I guess you have a situation too now whereby if you happen to be a trainer, uh, and I think Tom Mullins had a, a case of this at Leperstown, you win a, a bumper with an exciting young prospect, you probably think there's a fair chance that one of Willie's owners will be on the phone to buy that horse and probably to move him from your stable sure. to Willie's stable. Well, I mean, in a sense, you, you always need an element of that, don't you, to sort of keep the whole economic merry-go-round happening. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, there, there are trainers who just, it's, it's their business to identify a prospect, you know, bring it on um, and then sell it on for a profit so that you can sort of reinvest. Um, you know, I, I don't object to that. We, we, we've got to be careful here. We, you know, we should be lavishing praise on, on Willie for what he's doing. Um, but I, I, it can't be healthy for a small number of trainers to take over in the way that has happened in, in British and Irish jump racing over the last 10 years. And I, I, I wish officials were, were more interested in doing something about it. Well, OK, so on that one, so if, if, if the diagnosis from your perspective, I think from my perspective, is that it isn't a healthy thing, yeah. is there a remedy? Would you put in place something that might tackle it? Yeah, I mean, look, give me a free hand, and then I certainly would. I, I'd be looking at um, a limit on the number of horses that one licensee can have. I'd also be thinking about the, limiting the number of runners at a particular race meeting or festival that one licensee can have. Um, obviously, you have to you have to have quite widespread consultation about this first of all, because you know you have to think about the practicalities of it. You know, you, you can't have people working around the rules, and this is not something that the sport has looked at with any kind of degree of seriousness at all so you're mm -hmm. starting from ground zero doing this kind of thing but but jockeys are limited aren't they just now you know and for different reasons um they're limited to taking part in one race meeting a day if you can impose that kind of restriction on jockeys you can also impose a restriction on ch trainers generally uh, as long as you're clear that you're doing it for the good of the whole sport um and to promote you know the possibility of lots of trainers making a, a healthy living you know, which I think is what you need for a sort of thriving and popular sport going forwards. To be fair, it's what happens in Japan. The JRA actively limits the number of horses, um, the number of boxes a trainer can have, and the number of horses a trainer can have outside of the yard, if you like. So, in effect, it's the equivalent of, of, of a, a licensee or a licensor over here, BHA or IHRB, saying a trainer can have this many horses in training and X number with a pre-trainer, and that's the... That's a limit. And I suppose that pre-training thing is, 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 a, is a factor too, 
Mm. Because whereas once upon a time, Fred Winter or Fruit Warwin or whoever would have a set number of boxes and they'd probably manage their operation on that number of horses. These days, if you're a top trainer on the flat or the jumps, you can have 200 horses in your yard, but maybe another 100 or 200 waiting, waiting in the wings in. Yeah. outside to come into the yard at, at, at a given time. Yeah, I mean, that's another of those practical difficulties. But the main one that's in my mind is that um, if you're talking about jump racing, um, any kind of um, new regulation like that would have to be done jointly across Britain and Ireland. So you're talking about two yeah. completely different ruling bodies yeah. who would have to get on the same page. Um, two different sporting industries, really, um, that would have to agree to see things the same way and, um, and accept that kind of new restriction for the good of the whole. Yeah. Um, and that, that's going to be difficult. You know? but, but we haven't even begun that conversation. Um, and I think that's the thing that I regret the most, that you know, our senior officials, our leaders are not looking this issue in the face. Um, but it's, you know, it's pretty serious. You know, we, we, Willie sort of won 10 races at the last Cheltenham Festival out of 28. It's extraordinary stuff. Um, but I've written a bit about how that makes the races, you know, more predictable. We're getting shorter price mm -hmm. winners at the festival mm -hmm. than ever we used to. Um, and that, you know, that's bound to be taking the fun out of it for some of our fans. I mean, uh, equally, I guess there, there's people out there who just love lumping willies at short odds, you know. Actually, on that one, and we can move on to Cheltenham in a second, John, and ask you about that, but such is Willie Mullins' dominance now within, within jump racing. If I said to you, Emma's Allen was sensational in the, the cello hurdle on, on Saturday, I, I thought he was brilliant. Yeah. I think he'd win the Ballymore Novices hurdle. He was quoted at 3-1 to one and 4-1 to one by bookmakers after that race for the Ballymore. Do you think if Willie Mullins had sent Hermes Allen across to Newbury and he'd won that race in the way he did, that he would now be any shorter for the Ballymore? Yeah, I'd be tempted to say so. I mean, I think the market is just naturally bound to have more confidence in anything that's in Willie Mullins' yard. Yeah, yeah. Um, or for coming from Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because you, you, if, if it's the best horse in that discipline in Willie Mullins' yard, then you can kn know for sure it's been tested against quite a few other horses that would be potential candidates that he'll have. Um, and so, you know, that means more than if it was coming from a yard that didn't have the same strength and depth. Um, and of course, there's all that experience that you've got of watching Willie mopping up at Cheltenham Festival. So you know perfectly well that he'll mm. get it there in, in a one condition. So will Paul. The the Chal is a funny race, isn't it? It doesn't have the record that you might think in terms of producing festival no. winners. No, I hope he does this year, though. Yeah, well. And Jonathan, looking at those Cheltenham Festival markets, Chris was talking about how they now look very predictable. The Willie Mullins angle is obviously a huge factor in that. Do you think it's a, a, one of the reasons why? Uh, one major bookmaker, William Hill, uh, yesterday became the first to go non run and no bet on the festival's races so early. Yeah, I think it is because the, the markets seem to take shape earlier and earlier and those short price favourites seem to be trimmed faster and faster. And I, I know our sort of Mark Boylan's written about this before, about kind of pointless chopping of prices after a horse predictably wins a race at odds mm. on and then still gets shortened and it's I think the non-run no bet is probably trying to stick a bit of oomph and a bit of interest in a market that is already fairly or has already sort of taken shape and is fairly dull really because you've got a few short price favorites at the top larger prices that are probably not going to run there you're trying to encourage people to find an angle but it's difficult when it almost looks like you could feasibly, if you were to go through and look at all the favourites for those races, I, a lot of them you can't really see being beaten. And we're miles out from the festival, which is, is not how it should be. We should, it should be an open, open situation at the moment. Um, if you do think that Willie Mullins will train lots of winners at the Cheltenham Festival, or like me, you think that Ms. Allen will win the Ballymore uh, for Paul Nichols, you might want to be playing now then on those anti-post markets. But you can't, of course, if you are one of those punters who has had their account closed because you had a few wins, or maybe uh, you've had your account restricted and you're told that the £20 you'd like to have on Hermes Allen is actually £1.36 or something like that. It's a big issue, I think. It's one of my bugbears. It's what I've written about regularly uh, in my column in the Racing Post. I think it's a very damaging thing for British racing. Um, and Chris, you were talking earlier on about how you regret that this issue of trend domination hasn't been taken up at mm. all by racing's leaders. There's been silence in the room where it happens on that one. Well, for me, the same thing has been true of 
British racing and Irish racing's reaction to the situation of bookmakers closing and restricting accounts. I was therefore delighted when I saw Joe Summer Smith, the BHA chair, for an interview just before Christmas. That when I asked him about this question, he actually did talk about it. Now, Joe is someone who, in the interview, made clear that he is a punter at heart. He's not allowed to bet on British racing anymore because, or any racing anywhere in the world, because of his BHA uh, involvement. But he used to stake between 20 and 50 grand a week on betting. He still punts on uh, Portuguese second division football, which I'm not an expert on. You guys might be not, not my sort of thing. But he spoke about the restrictions and closures um, uh, problem. And I quoted him in my column today. He said it's a massive problem for the sport. People on racing trading desks would tend to agree. But the problem is most bookmakers are now run by the chief financial officer and accounting department. I would love bookmakers, Joe said, to look with more depth into what people are punting on. But punters now get flagged up by an algorithm. There is no mechanism for any subtlety. You're in trouble as soon as you've showed you can beat the price on a regular basis or if you open an account and happen to win with the first three bets. He then does go on to paint the other side of the, the picture and point out that a lot of uh, serious punters are opening umpteen accounts with, with one bookmaker and trying to manipulate the situation that way. And there are other reasons why bookmakers are facing a particularly competitive environment. But Joe made, I think, the, the really telling point here where he said, if you're a British punter, you get a really good deal so long as you're not a winning punter. And it seems to me that's a lamentable situation to be in for British racing. And I think, in particular, it's, it, it highlights the fact that at the moment, our racing leaders are going to government and saying we are adamant that the levy system should be changed from one based on profits to one mm. based on turnover because at the minute we benefit financially as a sport when our star horses lose and that is wrong for me it's equally wrong that we benefit when when punters lose and we 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 are yeah. actively encouraging at the minute punters to walk away from the sport because as soon as they start winning we say to them bookmakers say to them often we don't want your business please please go and they are racing fans who are being pushed out of the sport so for, for, from my perspective just as our racing leaders are going to government and saying we want to have um we want to have a, a, a proper gambling white uh, re review white paper that, that that treats affordability checks in a sensible way and we want levy reform to go from profits to turnover i think they should also be going to government and saying we want you to take an interest in this subject of how punters are being treated. Am I a naive optimist, Jonathan? Well, that's another question, but um, no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think it is a key issue, and it's something that's come up in conversations I've had uh, regarding affordability checks in the last couple of weeks, is that you, you're sort of, if you're a punter and you start to win, you're restricted. If you're a punter and you start to lose, you're also restricted because of affordability checks, and you have to prove you can afford to lose. So. The more hoops that are in the way for responsible punters, the less likely they are to bet on racing. And the difference between racing and other sports is if people stop betting on football tomorrow, you'd like to think it would survive, it's less reliant. Yeah. If people stop betting on racing tomorrow, such is the funding model, it would simply die. So they have to be taking that point to government that bookmakers, it, there needs to be some sort of special deal, some sort of tax edge, something that makes racing as a product that bookmakers are going to take seriously and are going to handle in a certain way that doesn't impact people who bet on the sport because the sport will suffer collateral damage. Chris, I, I, whenever I've, I've written about this, I've had lots of feedback from punters who say, yeah, I'm in this situation, this has happened to me. Um, I happened to uh, get a really good price on a horse the night before when the price opened up and I had my account restricted or closed. Um, I think it's a, it's a real issue. To what extent do you think it's a real problem? Yeah, it certainly is a real problem. I mean, it's fundamental for racing. If um, if betting on racing becomes you know harder, less attractive, you know less enjoyable, um, then that's a, a core part of the sports appeal, which you're um, undermining. We're going to lose our audience, um, and we're already feeling the pressure of trying to retain the people that, that we have. We've been saying for years, haven't we, and, and others in racing journalism, that it would be great if racing's leaders would get involved, would talk to bookmakers, and would try to establish some kind of deal, you know, um, to make sure that that racing punters were 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 being looked after, you know, and could feel that uh, secure in their ability to bet on the sport without being restricted and shut down. 
um, because, as I say, that's, that's such a fundamental part of the, the experience if you follow racing. Um, and it, it never really has felt like they, they've yeah. engaged in the way that they, you would hope. So five stars to Joe um, for, for getting involved in this way. And hopefully this is just the start of something that will be con uh, you know, a sustained interest. Um, I feel a certain amount of confidence in him um, you know, as, as a chair of the BHA. Um, being able to to think like a punter, you know, with the background and the experience that he's had, um, you, you you've, you've got a realistic hope. I think that the punter's interests are at least going to be borne in mind at the top of uh, racing's leadership whilst he's in that post. Um, it, it might be too late though, because you know the days are gone when the the staff at the top of every bootmaker were the sort of people who knew and cared about horse racing. I mean, you used to be able to take that for granted. Um, and who knew those were the glory days? It didn't necessarily feel like it at the time, but um, but we're no longer in a situation where you've got a guy like Chris Bell at the top of Ladbrokes who can say, you know, well, I, I think we should be sponsoring the St Ledger, you know, because it's just the sort of it's the right thing to do. It's a you know great old race with a long history. It matters a lot to me, and therefore it matters to the company. Um, you know, that kind of conversation doesn't go on anymore. It's all you know, um, very hard nosed business chat and. Um, you know, racing's percentage of uh, bookie turnover is, you know, falling year on year. We believe, um, and therefore we we're sort of of less and less interest to them. Um, so it's uh, it's hard times all round. Yes, um, I think that relationship needs to be recalibrated between the sport and bookmakers because my fear would be racing becoming sort of a, a method for attracting people to open accounts and then be siphoned towards other sports. Yeah towards the casino, towards everything else. Racing being used just simply as a shop window to get people in, you bet on racing and if you win you get restricted. We're, you're not the customer we want. We don't want winning racing customers, we want losing casino customers. You need to find a way of kind of creating more of a win-win scenario because at the moment I think racing's getting the short end of that deal. Just as um, we were saying earlier on how um, racing jurisdictions, governing bodies, you know, can take uh, an interest in the official line. JRA have done that, as we said before, mm. with, with train limits. If you, you look in Australia, if you are um, a punter in, say, New South Wales or Victoria, you know that there are rules in place between the governing body um, of its jurisdiction and the bookmakers, work through government, that um, if you're a punter, you have to be allowed to um, win a certain amount on a metropolitan race on the, on the day of the race, that you can't have your account closed just because you're a winning punter. There has to be an integrity reason behind that. So mm -hmm. it, it, it does show that something can be done. Now, I'm sure punters watching this in Australia would say that that's how the system should work in theory. In practice, it's a bit different. But it still shows that you can take a, a position on this as a, as a governing body. And that has to be, that has to be a, 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 a good thing. And, and whilst bookmakers over here would say that British punters have this great environment that Joe, Joe talks about with things like best odds guaranteed and all the different offers that they get, it's still no good if you're a winning punter and right. you find your accounts closed or restricted because you can't use those offers. I, mean, I think generally speaking, the interests of the punter are still not taken as seriously mm. um, when it comes to sort of racing's various discussions with itself as you would hope would be the case. I mean, at least the Horse Race Betters Forum was set up a few years ago um, by the BHA, but I, I still don't think it's involved in consultations in the way that it could be. You know, it, we've, we've now got sort of ready access to people who are there to represent the interests of punters, um, and they need to be used and involved in these discussions. And yes, as you say, there's, there's definite scope for, for acting. Um, th there would be a corollary from the bookmaker's perspective. You know, if, if you're asking them, to sort of um, reduce their ability to limit punters um, to close accounts when they feel that they need to, th then you need to be making sure that you're presenting them with a sport that you know has a high level of integrity. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not at the moment completely convinced that uh, that we're as tough um, on shenanigans, uh, to use a very broad term, as as we should be, as we used to be, indeed. I mean, we're, it's quite rare these days to see disciplinary cases based around. Um, um, betting, yeah. um, it, whereas the, you know we used to get a few of those come along. They're very difficult cases to prove, of course. We understand the problems associated, but I, I think you know it, the the ruling body needs to be very visibly and obviously tough on that kind of thing. And I guess your point would be, therefore, that anyone who might be tempted to indulge in shenanigans, shenanigans at the moment is not sufficiently afraid to do so. No, I don't think the deterrent is as great as it should be. Yeah. And of course, those deterrents have to be there for bookmakers and for punters and for the sport 
to work properly. Okay, final story this week. We've already spoken about one uh, humongously successful trainer in Willie Mullins, uh, who is very much not about to retire and hand over the license to his son, but somebody else, Chris, has. Now that you've said that, I bet Willie's going to announce it, <laughs> even before we get this out there. Um, yeah, Mark Johnson, um, he's, uh, now he wants to be clear that he's not retiring. He's not retiring. But he is taking his name off the licence, um, and starting this week, um, the licence is going to be in the sole name of Charlie Johnson, his son who's in his early 30s now, and has been um, a part of the, of the business, of the training um, for years and years, um, and an increasing part. Um, but Mark feels that um, he hasn't, um, Charlie hasn't had the credit that he deserves. Um, he mentions, you know, lots of other young and up and coming trainers who are getting plenty of, you yeah. know, acres of comment in the, in the racing press. Uh, I suppose he's thinking about people like George Bowie, Harry Eustace, who won a race at the Royal Ascot last summer. Um, and, you know, he says when those conversations come up, you, you know, you don't see Charlie mentioned in the way that he feels would be yeah. appropriate. You know, he thinks if you could go back over the last seven years, um, the number of winners that, that Charlie has basically effectively trained would be way more than, than some of these people who are being discussed in glowing terms. Um, I, I don't necessarily feel that, that Charlie's lost out um, because, you know, that's still a huge operation, but, yeah. um, you know, there's been no decline at all in their numbers. Um, it's only four years since we were writing the stories about Mark um, becoming the winning most trainer yeah, yeah. in the history of, of British horse racing. He'd got to about 4,183 or something. Right. And now um, 5,000? And now he's at 5,000 and in just you know, four, four and a bit years Don't later. You know, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Um, not just that he gets such big numbers of winners each year, but he keeps it on going. You yeah. know, there's never a fallow year. Uh, well, I say he, of course, I'm, they. I'm now being guilty yeah. of exactly what he's accusing us of. So they, the, the Johnson team. Um, so I, I sort of feel it's, it's maybe going to be a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the Richard Hannon's situation um, where, you know, they were effectively um, training together for a while before the, the younger man took over the license. Um, Mark, again, is very clear. He's, he's basically going to be still involved. In fact, I think he said in the day to day terms, um, he's going to be doing the same stuff. He, this is not like he's going to put his feet up and and go and fish in the med or wherever, <laughs> wherever one does fish. Um, he's, he's still going to be, you know, working as hard as before, which slightly surprises me. I mean, he's 63 years old. He's, and, you know, after all the achievements, you'd say he'd be fully entitled to just yeah. stop. But that's not his style, I guess. I mean, he's always had that sort of um, innate kind of aggression that I think has served him really well professionally. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it expresses itself sometimes in public in a, um, a refusal to back down when he's having an argument. I mean, in yeah. all of horse racing, he'd be maybe the, the last guy you'd ever expect to concede a point, wouldn't you? It's, it's is it right, it's nearly, in, and in a way it's sort of mirrors, doesn't it, the way that their horses run? Yeah. Like, you know, they, they go straight to the front and you think you're going to go past them and they just, they won't give up. And, and he's like that. And, you know, maybe there, there is a thing about just trainers putting their characteristics into the horses somehow by the, the way that they train them. Um, anyway, so, you know, we're obviously going to have to make a point of, uh, of giving Charlie his dues in the future. But I, I hope Mark's still going to be very vocal because, you know, he's be one of the most quotable trainers there's ever, ever been. In fact, I was just looking through some of the, the things I've written about him in the past. Um, there was one time when he was asked that um, typical question about who would your ideal dinner party guest be? Mm -hmm. um, and he said William Wallace, um, because let me see if I can get the quote here. Um, uh, William Wallace, of course, um, immortalised in the movie Braveheart, Braveheart. He strikes me as someone who epitomised my belief in confrontation, not negotiation. I mean, isn't that, that's like the yeah. most Mark Johnson quote there's ever, ever been. Um, and, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm sure that's been a core part of how he's been able to build up his business. I mean, he, this is a, a, a guy who sort of came from a council estate in East Kilbride. You know, there yeah. was no silver spoon aspect to anything that he's done. No. Um, and he started training in some um, rundown stable on the Lincolnshire coast, using a, a beach that was also being used as a bombing range by the RAF. Uh, and he's sort of trying to train his horses there in between bombing runs, basically. <laughs> and, and from that, you get to 5,000 winners, you know, and more than anyone else has ever managed. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's an amazing story. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's it's very hard to, to quantify the scale of his achievement because of how he's done it. It, it is utterly 
remarkable. And one feels at this point we should be eulogising about his achievements and talking about the, his great legacy uh, in horse racing. But because, as you say, he's not retiring and because he's adamant that he's still going to be part of the sport, it almost feels like it's too early uh, to be doing that. Although we won't be seeing the name M. Johnston against winners anymore. We're going to be seeing Charlie Johnston. That, that point he makes, I think, is really interesting about um, it's actually a very um, noble um, idea of stepping down so that your son can get more recognition yeah. for his achievements. And I do think there's, there's logic in that. I remember when uh, Charlie Fellows trained uh, a Group 2 winner at Glorious Goodwood uh, last year now. Um, he was saying that he fears that um, he's no longer deemed to be a sexy trainer because there are so many good young trainers coming through. And I, I think of Charlie Foles as a young trainer, but Charlie was saying I see so many young trainers going through. Um, and when we think of these young trainers coming through, I've got to admit that I don't think Charlie mentioned Charlie Johnson, out of no disrespect. And when I think of the top young trainers in British racing, I wouldn't have thought of, of Charlie Johnston. Now, is that because he's part of a training partnership? And Mark was very adamant that he doesn't believe that training partnerships are really a, a great thing. He doesn't necessarily see the... the, 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 the uh, specifically, he was meaning, I think, the shared licence. Yeah, so yes, yeah, yeah the shared licence. Um, is, it, is it because of that? Um, or is it because he's part of an operation whereby one individual is so dominant. I think it would be very hard for, for Charlie to have stood out up to now when you are working alongside someone who casts such a huge shadow over him. Because Mark is so successful, is so vocal on, on what he thinks. I think it would be hard for anybody to stand out. And I don't think Charlie Johnson is a shy, retiring butterfly. But against Mark, it's probably very hard to stand out. And because Mark is still going to be part of the scene, and because, as you say, Chris, He's not about to retire. He'll still be there on race courses. He'll be talking. I wonder mm. if much will change and if Charlie Johnson will suddenly start being recognised as one of the, the top trainers. Because in some ways, it's hard to know for people like us how good he is. Because you know that George Bowie is the, has been the sole licence holder. He hasn't been training with anybody else. Mm. You, know, you know that George Bowie is a, a tremendously successful trainer because he is doing the training. When you have two people training the horses like this officially, um, it's not as clear who is doing who is doing what. It's hard to dish out the, the plaudits. And it, I think that's, that may, may not change because, say, Mark isn't about to disappear. I think it will change gradually over time, but it's going to be a sort of long-term transitional thing, isn't it? Um, I mean, Mark repeatedly insists that in terms of the way they do the job, nothing is going to change. And, and that's the message that you want to project to your owners yes, because of course clients, yeah. you, you know you've got that long established history of great success and you and want them to feel it's going to yeah. continue um, and I'm sure it will continue um, and, and Mark's described his role uh, as more of a sort of managing director um, going forward you know if, if that gives us any kind of an insight but I think inevitably once Charlie is the sole name on the license um, and you know they both you know get a bit older and, and maybe their the depth of their interest in the business evolves and changes Charlie is going to take over, isn't he? He's, he's going to start making his own decisions mm -hmm. about the way that they should do things. Um, and, you know, over time, um, I should think the share of the credit that he's getting for these horses will become greater and greater. I mean, say they have a great Royal Ascot this year um, and, and his is the only name on the licence. You know, I would think all of that credit will accumulate to him. Do you think so, Jonathan? You don't think that Mark has to go off and run a B&B in the lakes for Charlie to um, get the credit he deserves? No, I don't think so. I think... Um I wouldn't, it, they're trying to sell it as essentially an administrative thing and just being a name on the license and it's as you were, but I think it will be significant, as Chris says, that if you're the sole name on the license, you're the one to whom the praise is directed naturally. And it's a similar situation with Baby Gosden, isn't it, with John Gosden. It's difficult to quantify how large an impact he is having and how large an impact Charlie Johnson is having while the long established boss, as it were, is still on the license. It's sort of our halfway house, but as you say, we'll move towards him being the, the man in charge, certainly in race cards, and in the future solely in charge. And, you know, it hasn't done Richard Hannon and Andrew Bowling and the like too much harm, has it? No. That no. association with the, with the father. That's true, that's true. And I think it's guaranteed that we're going to be right about tons of Charlie Johnson trained winners 
across 2023. And so we come to the end of our first front page in 2023. And as we did in 2022, which is the job of the host to decide who has the winning front page story um, this week. Um, I mean, I, th I think the bet restriction story in the camp plays and Joe Somers is entering that debate is, is, is very strong indeed. But again, I would talk about a noble act, Mark Johnson handing across oh. the line. I think it'd probably yeah. be noble of me to say I'm not going to be involved this week. And I, 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 I you know, so I, I'm not going to make my front page story the winning story. You're not? No, I'm not. No. Wow. No. Is, is this the first time this has happened? Or? Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> um, and. and um, I mean, you know, you, you of course have yeah, a... You can't beat a story about the winning most trainer in the history of the sport, right? No, no, but you can. Because, uh, because Mark, as you, as you said yourself, is not retiring. He's still going to be there. And um, I think he'd be embarrassed if we... If we Fair enough, yeah, he does. Yeah. He doesn't want to No, I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. So you, Jonathan, um, that, that whole issue of the domination um, of um, a few people and one particular person in jump racing, which I know is a big issue for Chris as well, it will carry us through to the Cheltenham Festival and beyond. I'm making your story the winning story. This week, congratulations. Thank you very much. Apologies. Um, thank you. That then is the end of the show. Apart from me directing you towards uh, a thing that was wonderful in 2022 and it'll be wonderful in 2023, the Racing Post app. You should download our new app with exclusive content from the biggest names, people like Jonathan and Chris. Free daily tips from our star tipping lineup and much, much more besides. Thank you to Jonathan and to Chris. Thank you to watching. We'll be back for the second show of 2023 next week. Until then, bye-bye.